Today I'm going to be bringing you a contemplation of Vincent van Gogh's art in relation to the faith and compassion that we held. The SALT project this year produced a Lenten meditation based on Van Gogh's life and art. And so I'll be reading directly from that, along with bringing in some information that I know that I got from the book, Learning from Henry Nouwen and Vincent Van Gogh, A Portrait of a Compassionate Life. So Van Gogh was born in the Netherlands in 1853. His father was a pastor. And so Vincent was very much interested in becoming a pastor himself. And, and I was surprised to learn a few years ago that he was an evangelist in the Belgian mining district. He also did a lot of artwork there. And, but they decided that he didn't have much of a preaching ability which I say that his art actually was his way of preaching. So he decided to become an artist to preach not with words, but with color and light. So his younger brother, Theo, was an art dealer in Paris. And so Van Gogh, Vincent, would send art to his brother. And then Theo would send back some money. So they, there was a lot of correspondence that went between the two of them. And that's how we learn more about Vincent and his thought behind his paintings. So we start off looking at still life with the Bible. We can see that Van Gogh was really looking at a deep kinship between scripture and modern literature, because here we have the Bible, it's open to Isaiah 53, where the prophet declares how God's salvation will take place through a suffering servant, a figure Christians traditionally identify with Jesus. And then next to that is Emile Zola's novel, Joy de Vivre. And so Van Gogh knew that its heroine was an orphan who undergoes a life of adversity and harm. A modern icon, as Van Gogh saw it, of living as a suffering servant. In a letter to his sister, Vincent said, I myself am always glad that I have read the Bible more thoroughly than many people nowadays, because it eases my mind somewhat to know that there were once such lofty ideas. But because of the very fact that I think the old things so beautiful, I must think the new things beautiful with all more reason. For Vincent, there are many ways to God. One man wrote or told it in a book, another in a picture. And Vincent wanted to live as a kind of suffering servant. He told Theo, I tell you, I consciously choose the dog's path through life. I will remain a dog. I shall be poor. I shall be a painter. I want to be human going into nature. In this still life, Van Gogh invites us to recognize the way of humility as including suffering. Not, we not that we should in any way pursue suffering or seek to pro prolong it, but rather that we embrace the truth that following Jesus, the suffering servant, means encountering difficulties and losses. Van Gogh also did a form of Lecto Divinio where he would contemplate on a passage of the Bible and then find a way to put himself into it. So here we have the paintings, the Good Samaritan and the raising of Lazarus. And one thing that we can note is that if we look, it looks as if Van Gogh placed himself in the picture here as the Good Samaritan and actually down here as Lazarus. It makes me wonder if there was a point in Van Gogh's life where he felt that he was rising from the dead. I think the Good Samaritan also reflects his love for people like farmers and rural folks who he just wanted to be able to connect with. 
And then here in the Pieta, another painting that this is um, based on a painting of Delacroix. Vincent would often paint, repaint, take something from another artist and put it into his own style. And so this was the Pieta. And again, you can see with the red hair, the red beard, that Vincent was using himself as a model for Christ in this painting. Then we have a set of portraits from when he was in the Netherlands, when he was living with his parents. Van Gogh very much admired peasant family. And he hoped to be able to express how he felt about peasant families in his paintings. He thought rural farmers possessed hard-won humility, honesty, and a profound connection with nature. These were virtues he believed many city dwellers had lost or left behind. He used a color palette inspired by unpeeled potatoes to signify the family's full communion with their labor and its fruit. His overall aim was to, to convey that those people eating their potatoes in the lamplight have dug the earth with those very hands they put in the dish, that they have thus earned, honestly earned, their food. And he thought pictures like this could be very beneficial on urbanites. If a stable smells like dung, all right that belongs to a stable. If the field has the ripe odor of ripe corn or potatoes or guano or manure, that's healthy, especially for city people. Such pictures might teach them something. So for these, these paintings of rural farmers, he is really just trying to express the humility that he sees in them, the honesty, their connection with, of, with nature. And as an expression of Christian devotion, he's showing that, the, that this form of life trusts in God for guidance, care, and security, and accordingly finds human dignity not only in a wealthy palace, but also, even especially, in a farmer's humble home. And then we move on to probably one of the most important parts of Van Gogh's vast library of artwork, and those are the sunflowers. And so this, these came about during his most prolific time, when, um, and around 1888. For Van Gogh, sunflowers symbolized gratitude. And he had this idea of a triptych as I, that I tried to replicate here, where he has the sunflowers, and then in the center, he has the picture of La Bersus, the lullaby, where the woman is rocking a cradle with that rope that she has in her hand. She's just using that to rock a cradle. And Vincent wrote to Theo, the idea came to me to paint a picture in such a way that sailors who are at once children and martyrs, seeing it in the cabin of their Icelandic fishing boat, would feel the old sense of being rocked come over them and remember their own lullabies. With this vision, with the sunflowers and la Bersus, it can be seen as a divine portrait, the loving mother who comforts and cares for us, an altarpiece for the ocean and by extension for all of creation. Van Gogh envisioned an overarching motherly love, gently rocking the cradle of humanity, singing a lullaby, and then on each side a vase of brilliant sunflowers symbolizing gratitude, evoking both the glories of the fields outside and the sweet serenity of a home. A simple arrangement of flowers, boldly, beautifully, and possibly yellow. Along with this is the girl kneeling in front of a cradle. Vincent wrote to Theo, but if one feels the need of something grand, something infinite, something that makes one feel aware of God, 
one need not go far to find it. I think I see something deeper, more infinite, more eternal than the ocean and the expression of the eyes of a little baby when it wakes in the morning and coos or laughs because it sees the sun shining on its cradle. If there is a ray from on high, perhaps one can find it there. And then there was a time where Vincent was a big admirer of Japanese art, like many of the Impressionists were, and he liked the way they studied and depicted nature. He said, if we study Japanese art, we see a human being who is undoubtedly wise, philosophic, and intelligent, who spends his time doing what? In studying the distance between the earth and the moon? No. In studying Bismarck's policy? No he studies a single blade of grass. He felt that Japanese artists live in nature as though they themselves were flowers. And so he contemplated the flowers in such a way that he felt himself as one with Japanese artists and wanted to paint in their style. He said, we must return to nature in spite of our education and our work in a world of convention. And so when he moved to the south of France, he said, here my life will become more and more like a Japanese painter's, living close to nature. Even when he was in St. Remy Asylum, he wrote that the central driving idea of his work was to think that a field of wheat or a cypress is well worth the trouble of looking at close up. In the almond blossom, we encounter not only the fruitfulness of nature, but also Vincent's desire to learn from his Japanese counterparts. Inspired by the painter Jean-Francois Jean Millet, the painter's painting of a sower, Vincent did no less than 30 paintings or drawings on the theme. He wrote, I am working on another so sower an immense citron disc, as we can see here, is the sun, a green yellow sky with pink clouds, the field violet, the sower and the tree of Prussian blue. Many have pointed out how the central tree in this painting echoes the Japanese Prince Vincent Prize as well as how the sun serves as a kind of halo, suggesting that the sower is also a saint. Some have even discerned a cruciform shape in the tree's silhouette. And the background of all this, of course, is Jesus's famous parable of the sower. To a fellow painter, Vincent wrote that Jesus lives serenely as a great artist than all other artists despising marble and clay as well as color, working in living flesh. As Vincent said, Jesus unified image and word in his art of the parable. Jesus's words are one of the highest summits, the very highest summit reached by art, which becomes a creative force there, a pure creative power. In a lot of ways, Vincent is telling his own story of the parable. He is also telling stories through all of his paintings, and we want to be able to look at them in such a way. They intended to create little experiences, little worlds that we can enter. The sower evokes Jesus' parable of the sower, and the sower himself with the sun's halo glowing behind him can be seen as a kind of Christ figure, the word of God sowing the words of God. With this in mind, the central tree suggests multiple things at once. The cross, the tree of life, and the growth to which every seed is called. And here we have the shoes. They were by no means a common subject for painters in Vincent's day. He bought this pair in a flea market. And then after walking in them through the Parisian mud for some time, he decided to paint them, scuffs and all. He said, poetry surrounds us everywhere, but putting on it on paper is, alas, not so easy as looking at it. 
He reveled in finding beauty and presence in ordinary places and things. For Vincent, this kind of looking is also a kind of love. He put it this way, but I always think the best way to know God is to love many things. Love a friend, a wife, something, whatever you like, you will be on the way to knowing more about God. That is what I say to myself. But one must love with a lofty and serious intimate sympathy, with strength, with intelligence, and one must always try to know deeper, better, and more. This leads to God that leads to unwavering faith. Throughout his life, Van Gogh was profoundly interested in the lives of impoverished communities and people. Like a kind of artistic friar, Vincent lived a life of poverty himself. And in this painting of a pair of shoes, like Mary, Vincent turns his attention to the feet of a human being, his own, but also the feet of the anonymous former owner of these shoes and by extension, the feet of ordinary working people everywhere. In a sense, Vincent anoints such people with his painting, lifting up these common objects and the common lives they invoke into the light of dignity and struggle, beauty and grace. And of course, any meditation on Van Gogh would just not be complete without Starry Night. It's one of his most famous and beloved pictures, and it was painted during his year-long stay in the asylum in Saint-Rémy. It's an imaginative composite, combining the view of the night sky out his window with other studies he'd previously done. He wrote to his sister, it often seems to me that the night is even more richly colored than the day, colored in the most intense violets, blues, and greens. If you look carefully, you'll see some stars are lemony, others have a pink, green, forget-me-not blue glow. It's clear that to paint a starry sky, it's not nearly enough to put white spots on blue back. Blue back. In Starry Night, Vincent brings these ideas to life, combining close observation of nature with an exuberant dynamic style. He considered this a more spontaneous drawing as opposed to a more realistic representational style, which he dismissed as delusive precision. He believed that with these vibrant colors, he could express the purer nature of the countryside and give consolation or to prepare the way for a painting that will give even greater consolation. In Starry Night, Vincent imbues creation with a similar sense of symphonic spirited effervescence. The heavens radiate and swirl and the landscape below bathed in moonlight and starlight mirrors this almost liquid quality of graceful movement. The land's creatures, the cypress tree, no less than the steeple, reach up to the sky. The joy and hope of Palm Sunday is a glimpse of this vibrant choreography as the people of God sing with the stones would otherwise shout, peace in heaven and glory in the highest, Hosanna in the highest. In Cafe Terrace at night, Vincent was seeking to capture the beauty of the night sky. And though he never explicitly said so, some scholars recently wondered if there might be echoes of the Last Supper in Cafe Terrace at night. There are 12 diners surround a single long haired figure standing in the middle. A shadow lurks in the doorway. A common trope in Last Summer painting, Last Supper paintings is to depict Judas leaving the scene. And there are three cruciform shapes hidden in plain sight. One immediately above the standing figure. You can see that in its window behind that standing figure. One on that figure's torso, which you may have to be able to get another view of it, and one in the distance with the approaching horse and carriage. Whether or not Vincent in consciously intended these references, Cafe Terrace at Night can help us reflect on the ways communion not only happened long ago, but also happens again and again in our daily lives. 
sometimes hidden, sometimes plain. Vincent wrote that his hope was that wherever I go, I'll be preaching the gospel. And this approach to life, after all, entails seeing and hearing the gospel everywhere. And here we have at eternity's gate. He painted this in 1890, the year of his death. And it was based on a lithograph he had made some years earlier entitled, Worn Out. Of that lith lithograph, he wrote, I was trying to say this in this print, but I can't say it as beautifully, as strikingly as reality, of which this is only a dim reflection seen in the dark mirror. That it seems to me that one of the strongest pieces of evidence for the existence of something on high in which Malay believed namely in the existence of a God and an eternity, is the unutterably moving quality that there can be in the expression of an old man like that, without his being aware of it, perhaps, as he sits so quietly in the corner of his heart. At the same time, something precious, something noble, that can't be meant for the word, worms. This is far from all theology, Vincent continued, simply the fact that the poorest woodcutter, heath farmer, or miner can have moments of emotion and mood that give him a sense of an eternal home that he is close to. At Eternity's Gate can help us catch another sight aspect of this bright sadness dimension of the crucifixion. Even in moments of great sorrow, when we are thoroughly worn out, when we feel isolated and alone in the shadows, in such moments, if we look deeply, we can indirectly sense the light that every shadow involves. A vision of a lonely, despairing old man can stir within us a recognition of luminous dignity, something precious, something noble, as Vincent put it, that points to the reality of something on high. The despair is still real, of course, and nonetheless devastating, but we know it isn't the end of the story. Outside Vincent's room at the St. Rami Asylum, this is what he would see. Through the iron barred window, I see a square field of wheat in an enclosure, he wrote to Theo, above which is the morning sun in all its glory. Imagining the wider view, Vincent painted the wheat field behind St. Paul's Hospital in St. Remy, a vision of the world glimpsed through iron bars, a portrait of freedom that evokes the reaper of death, a wide open landscape painted from within a kind of tomb. On one hand, all of us are in some version of Vincent's situation, trying to improve our health and our spirits, our vision limited by our point of view, and our lives limited by iron bars of one kind or another holding us back. And yet, on the other hand, all of us can also take part in Vincent's life-giving imagination, picturing more than we can see, making beauty where we can, and dreaming of a new world to come. This is the, on the one hand, on the other hand, ambiguity of Holy Saturday, a day for silence and prayer, for feeling Christ's crucified absence of can we all more joyfully celebrate Christ's resurrected presence to come. Wheat Fields with Crows Under a Stormy Sky is the last major work of Vincent's life, though it's not his last painting. He was also working on a study of some exposed tree roots. He described this painting to Theo in this way. There are vast fields of wheat under troubled skies, and I did not need to go out of my way to try to express sadness and extreme loneliness. I hope you will see them soon, for I hope to bring them to you in Paris as soon as possible, since I almost think that these canvases will tell you what I cannot say in words, the health and restorative forces I see in the country. This painting is often interpreted as a portrait of menace and madness, but Vincent describes it in a different direction. In a different direction. The skies are troubled, he says, evoking sadness and loneliness, 
but the overall effect is an example of nature's health and restorative forces. Vincent once insisted to Leo that Theo, that looking at a wheat field, even in the form of a picture, offered a great deal to suffering people, much more than abstract words or hollow assurances. And the Japanese artists Vincent so admired often included humble, common birds, often blackbirds in their compositions. The sky may indeed be stormy, but the regenerative powers of nature, both in the wheat and in the crows, rise to meet it. This is basically can help us mediate on this mix of light and shadow. Easter is indeed a time for trumpets, but it's only the beginning. The skies are still troubled. Loneliness and heartache hang in the air. And yet at the same time, the loving, liberating power of God is on the move. Vibrantly clear if we have eyes to see. And the wheat rising, the crows rising, the wind rising, and the spirits rising. As we behold this dynamic healing scene, this visual parable of restoration, proclaiming good news in ways that reach beyond words. And in all this, I just want to bring up that the man that we have long heard committed suicide at the end, this just doesn't seem to ring true. One of the things that I have found through the past few years in my study of Van Gogh is that there is an alternative theory to how he died. He used to wander through the fields outside our lives and, and would look for places where he could paint. And there were a young, young, number of young men in the area who would follow him and tease him and bully him. And it is actually thought that those young men may have shot him and because he was shot in the stomach, he went back home, and it took three days for him to die. It is thought that he understood how he was perceived by others, and that these young men did only what they wanted to do in order to feel safe or because of how they saw him. And he did not want them to live with that for the rest of their lives. He did not want them punished for this crime. And so he didn't tell anyone what happened. Instead, he just allowed himself to go ahead and die. For the compassion and love that Vincent had for the peasant people, for nature, to me, this seems like the most natural way for Vincent to go. Yes, he was a troubled man, and there's been lots of work done on trying to figure out what was actually going on with him and what mental illness or condition he may have had. But he still had a lot of compassion. And as we can tell from these writings, he had a great love of God and nature. And so the suicide, for some reason, just doesn't ring true with me. But the idea of him basically sacrificing himself so that these young men would not have to, to be punished for what they did seems to me more true to Vincent's nature. And then I found this last poem, Van Gogh's Prayer by Janos Peluzinski. A battle lost in the cornfields and in the sky of victory. Birds, the sun, and birds again. By night, what will be left of them? By night, only a row of lamps, a wall of yellow clay that shines, and down the garden, through the trees, like candles in a row, the panes. There I dwelt once and dwell no longer. I can't live where I once lived, though. The roof there used to cover me. Lord, you covered me long ago. Thank you for letting me share my love of Vincent Van Gogh with you. Thank you very much.